using Git as a sysadmin. So I was here a little bit earlier and talked, but for those of you like Gary who weren't here, I will reintroduce myself. <laughs> My name is Matt Zasky, and I work as a developer and the, a fleet administrator at the University of Minnesota Morris, uh, which is one of five system campuses in the University of Minnesota system. And I do some other stuff. I do some 3D printing. I do some um, other tinkering. I write about stuff once in a while and put it out on a blog. Um, I'm on the old Bird app and GitHub and Discord and uh, the Blue Sky, and I have email. So, um, so just jumped right into it. Why Git? Right? Why do I need Git? Well, we need version and source control. That's really it. We've already talked about it a couple times, right? I mentioned it during the task sequence uh, session, and it came up uh, with Haley just now about um, Ansible playbooks and things. So even if you don't think you need source control as a uh, sysadmin, the reality is you do. I mean, who here has ever written? Um, it's like the old Word document thing, right? It's this is version two, final, 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 final. And then how many people have lost? I mean, I did that last week for a file, right? So you need version control for lots of different reasons. I like to think about it as automatic backups and distribution, because if you're using a tool, uh, a, a management tool like uh, GitHub or GitLab, or there's a number of different hosting providers, you can self-host your own if you really want. Uh, GitHub Enterprise is another one. Then if you have that central repository, you can get access to your stuff from wherever you are. Um, because I know if you're anything like me, I have been on the wrong machine where that script that I really just changed doesn't live anymore. Um, another reason why I personally like Git is it forces you to create some indirect and implicit documentation because when you make a change and then you commit said change, you really should create a commit message that is that has some meaning of some sort, right? What that looks like is a different creature, but that gives you some form of documentation, whatever that is. Um, but another thing is it's platform independent. You know, Haley just showed how to do it in uh, WSL, Linux. It's on Mac, it's on Windows, it's everywhere. Um, I kind of wish it was installed by default in Windows. So maybe somebody in the Microsoft ecosystem will hear that at some point and it'll just ship with Windows. That would be great. And that would solve lots of problems, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, and another reason why you need to have Git is to save future you from today's you. So I mentioned this, this came up in the task sequence session too, where if you make a change and you think that that's the greatest change ever and I will never, ever have to look at my old stuff. Six months from now, you might decide that that wasn't such a good thing and now you do actually have to go back and you don't have any record of that and Git uh, provides that for you. So a uh, quick slide here about Git and Git tools. So the required tooling for Git is to install Git. And I actually wrote this slide before that happened. So. <laughs> I really was just setting you up for success. Ben. That's right. I'm like, hey, this is what not to do. Apparently. Um, so you need to install Git. Once you have installed Git, you have everything you need to use it. Um, when you install Git, it will come with Git Bash, and that's the command line option that you can use. Uh, most people, though, I will say, don't actually use Git Bash. I, you don't really need to because if you use common tooling for Git, such as GitHub Desktop or VS Code, everything that you really historically needed to use a command line for can be done for you in GitHub Desktop or VS Code. So that business of in some cases, even setting your username, it will walk you through doing that um, with those tools once you set it up. It's easier, I will say, if you use optional tooling, like a github.com account, because when I was setting up for the, the little bit of demos that I'll do here, um, if you have a GitHub account, you log in to your GitHub account in VS Code or GitHub Desktop, and then it already knows who you are. So it's super it's super simple and super straightforward in that way um, azure devops account is another thing if that's if that's your jam and you want to get into azure devops stuff and there's a ton of vs code plugins that you can use 
And oh, GitHub Dev. GitHub.dev is basically a VS Code editor in the browser that um, I don't personally use. I used it a little bit when it first came out because it was cool and shiny, um, but I don't generally use it because in most cases for me, I already have all the tooling that I need in the places where I'm working, but once or twice I have been at a place and I don't want to install all the stuff so I can just go to github.dev and actually accomplish what I was going to do. So, with that being said, um, everybody has everybody used Git, installed Git, maybe? Okay, some. When, when you first started with Git, because I know this happened to me, you look up how to use Git on the internet and you'll find some, some various form of uh, commentary <laughs> that will tell you that you need to do all these things. And what I've what I've learned over the years is that in my own journey and then sharing with other folks is really all you need to do Git as a sysadmin in particular, if you're not doing development, is four things. You need to know how to clone or create a repository. You need to know how to commit those changes. And you need to understand how to push to in the I say push to Git, but it's GitLab, GitHub, Azure DevOps, where whatever your uh, central repository is and then how to pull from it because if you know those four actions you actually can self-distribute all your source you don't have to worry about working with other people you don't have to worry about doing any of this other stuff you can actually use git successfully without getting stuck in the weeds about all the other best practices and stuff so when I first started, it was like that, right? Where I was like, no, but now you understand it's not so scary. And this is not actually my slide, but I love this slide visual. Um, it's from Andreas. Uh, and it, it illustrates, I think, really well and succinctly how Git works for a visual learner, right? So basically the things you wanna take take away from this is what happens on the left hand side with the local side and what happens in the remote side um, with GitHub or Azure DevOps. So you have a working directory and then the remote repo stuff. So in this particular case, you're going to clone down to your local machine from the other, the other side. Um, <clears throat> you're going to make changes. You're going to add a file. You're going to commit some stuff and then you're going to push that back to GitHub. And one of the things that confused me at first, because I came from old CVS and uh, SVN land from my other developer days, is what does push and pull mean? Because it's really confusing to say, well, I, I'm making, I'm, I'm pulling from GitHub, but I'm putting in a pull request in GitHub. Like, how is that? What, and then why do I push? And the way I've thought about it and the way I try to share with folks is, I think about where I'm acting at that moment. So if I'm on this laptop right here, I need to get that code to GitHub. That means I have to push it to GitHub. If I'm going to grab that code, I need to get that to this machine. I'm going to pull it from GitHub. But conversely, and I'll talk about this in a minute, but if you're making a pull request, you're doing that action on GitHub. So you're in GitHub, you're there and you're pulling that change into your other things. So it's really important and useful, I think, to think about where where you're where you are doing the action, where that code is coming to or going from. Um, so anyway, back to this, there might be some other changes that your teammates make on the remote side, and then you're going to pull those changes back to your machine, where then you have that. You're going to add change. OK, but then you're going to add another file. You didn't pull. You didn't push that right away back to GitHub. You can do as many changes locally as you want. Add, commit, and then push that back. And when you do that push action, you can notice on the right there that that snapshot that you didn't push in the moment also got pushed in the in the push action. Right? So I like this visual just because it, I think it shows that cycle. So get VS Code plugins. Plugins are super awesome. There are also a million of them. It's really easy to get overwhelmed with some. So I cherry picked a few that I tend to like. One is Git Graph. Um, it's really great for visualizing the repo, especially when you start working with branches, because it will give you these pipes. 
and then it will say here is where this file is and it'll show you visually how that uh, evolution changed. Uh, Git history is another one. It allows you to see that um, commit history by the file in sort of a linear way, but not in the not in a visual. It'll give you the the commit history and who did it and that kind of stuff. And Git Lens is probably the one that most functionally I end up using because a it's the most invasive in my opinion, but it has the most buttons, and it allows you if you hover over something, it will actually pop up the last commit. So it'll say, you did this three months ago. This was you, or this was, a, if you're working in a team, it'll show that your teammates were with those folks. Um, and there are other plugins aplenty, um, some for GitHub specific stuff, Azure DevOps actions, there's all kinds of different plugins. But uh, I would start with one of the simpler ones, if you will, and then kind of grow into, because you can get very overwhelmed. All right. So I mentioned this a little bit earlier, uh, pull requests. And I think if you're working as a sysadmin, solo or even with a team, the last and fifth action you really kind of need to understand is a pull request. When you start talking about pull requests, what is happening then is you got to start thinking about branch strategies. So this is where we start talking about some interesting angles of if I'm working solo or if I'm working with a team of folks. And this is where the guidance that you'll often see from folks on the internet tends to be skewed much more toward the, this is my team operation. And so we have rules and these are the rules we have to follow. Therefore, everybody must follow those rules. Okay, if you have a team, that's a fair play. But if you're doing it by yourself, you can create your own rules and you don't have to be um, super strict as a but with that being said, a pull request is really a branch merge action. And so what will happen is when you create a branch, you're going to diverge from your original point off to the side. And at some point, you have to bring that code back together. You can branch merge manually at the command line or with the tooling. Uh, like I think GitHub Desktop will do it for you. Um, I used to do that. And I discovered, even though most of my projects are myself, I don't, I mean, I share with the team, but my team doesn't interact with that code and edit it much. But I was finding that, again, back to you have to be cognizant of where you are in the code. It's really easy to get that branch merge command backwards. So you merge, you might merge your main branch into your feature branch instead of the other way around. And then it can cause all sorts of really bizarre things. What, what I wound up doing is I moved into creating my own pull requests for my own projects because I'll push the code to GitHub and then I will create a pull request for myself and GitHub, because of the, uh, the UI and whatnot, it makes it more obvious to me that I'm doing what I really wanted to do as opposed to remembering a command line thing. It's kind of a, kind of an interesting piece but if you're try if you're just learning it's easy to get stuck on how branch merging works anyway pull requests also also automatically create implicit documentation because you also have to put in like what is this pull request so even if you had i'll say bad commit messages if you're really doing a big action like a pull request then you know it's going to force you to do that um, I already mentioned some of the differences between solo, solo and team projects, and the biggest one to my mind is the sort of standards. Are you doing, um, some teams will have very specific rules about retaining branches, when to delete branches, all these other things, um, and it gets into commit philosophies. <laughs> if you're working by yourself and it's broken and you're cool with that, you can commit whatever you want, commit early, commit often. But if you are working as part of a team and the rule is don't commit something that's broken, then maybe don't do that, right? Um, and there is this really neat visualization tool. It's in the browser. It's tough to show. Will it, will it let me do it? Uh, I didn't work that way. Um, oh, let me get do it this way. Control click. Here we go. 
I'm not going to walk through this, but it's really neat. Learn get branching .js or learning you now learn get branching .js .org. This is a tool that takes you through some steps to basically learn and understand in a visual sense how branching works. And so you can come up with your own uh, little yeah introduction to git commits. So you're going to walk through this little tutorial and it's going to show you all this visual stuff. And it's a super neat little utility if you have no, you know, you're unfamiliar of the concept of branching seems kind of foreign to you. Um, yeah, so do that if you can. Uh, let's see, let's launch this back. Um, or yeah, get branching. Okay, so I mentioned the branching thing. Here's another nice little visual. You'll have a main branch of some sort and then you're gonna create your deviation. This is usually a feature thing or a, in some cases, if you're working on your own little scripts, it might be, this is my June version of the script, right? You're gonna make some commits, some changes, whatever. And in, in normal cases, if you're working with a team, you're gonna at some point put in a pull request, but you can put in a pull request for yourself, like I mentioned. A pull request most often will be more formalized with some feedback loop. Somebody will do a code review or whatnot in a team. I use it as a code review for myself in a sense of, did this actually include all the changes that I thought it did? Because again, in GitHub, it will show you in those, um, in the UI, what has changed so, kind of side by side. Once you're satisfied with that, it will create that merge commit in some cases and build, you can do build validations. It's a little bit much, but, and it will then merge that branch back into your main and then Depending upon who you ask, it's a good practice to delete those branches once they're no longer in use. Because the history will all still be there, but you don't need that branch just hanging out there indefinitely. Your mileage may vary, choose what you want. I personally, I tend to on solo projects delete those branches, but I don't always. So with that being said, I like to think about Git for documentation because one way to really get familiar with Git and Git Actions is to use it for documentation, your own documentation. Um, the, the meaning behind it or the magic behind it is Markdown. So if you don't know any Markdown, Markdown's a really great way to get started and it's fairly simple. Learn some syntax for Markdown. It's useful in lots of places, Discord, Slack, all these other things. Um, it's small and mighty. Readme files, everybody's seen readme files. Some of them look nicer, some of them don't. The nice ones, they're almost always just markdown files. Microsoft Docs, a lot of the Microsoft Docs stuff, specifically the stuff that you can edit with a little pencil on those pages and submit, that's, it's an oversimplification, but it's all built on GitHub pages in essence, right? So there are VS code extensions for previewing and working with markdown. Um, there are many and you ch you need to choose sort of what you're trying to do. I don't really wanna go into this a whole lot. These are some neat ones. Um, you can take Excel, turn it into a markdown table. So if you're trying to present some sort of tabular data, you can uh, have it convert that for you. Uh, markdown all in one is the one I, I tend to use and it just has some um, cheaters in it. Uh, Markdown Preview Enhanced is if you're really into previews. Uh, paste Image and Draw I.O. though. Draw I.O. at MMS, somebody mentioned it as a possible contender uh, for folks who don't, who use Visio but don't use it a lot because you can create flowcharts and things and then it renders it to a PNG and it somehow ties into Markdown. I don't know how that magic happens, but it's kind of neat. Um, so. GitHub pages, like I said, they're built with Markdown content. Um, static content is automatically built when you do a push to GitHub. So it's a special type of repo, in essence, a branch. And you do that. You actually have your own development pipeline. You didn't have to do anything to it. You just say, this is a GitHub pages branch, and this is where it's going to go, and it will build it for you. So it's your first, like, baby's first DevOps. <laughs> Um, and it's really easy to use for internal project documentation. 
I'm a nerd. I have had this um, since it was, well, it was the mid nineties. I have this Monty Python script site that I didn't know what to do with. And it was the nineties. And so it was a thing. And what I did in its last iteration a couple of years ago is I needed to port it to something else. And I converted all those old script files to Markdown and put it up out on GitHub where it will live forever. Um, <laughs> And here it is, man, right? Like the holy grail. And some guys at co in college transcribed this years and years ago. The underpinnings of all this is built in Markdown. I also have it over here. You can edit the content or provide suggestions. So once in a while, somebody will find a typo <laughs> and they will submit that. And it's much like how Microsoft documentation is. When you go in there to edit the content or provide a suggestion, suggestions will create issues in the GitHub repo for this. And uh, edit content will take you into actually where you can actually edit this. And when you submit that, it creates a pull request. And then I get an email that says, Joe decided that this is a typo in the script. Please review and change. And I'm like, thank you, Joe. Approved. <laughs> and a few minutes later, it renders out the page again. So, it, you know, it's it's an interesting it's an interesting thing. I surprised. Oh, here's the actions. So, oh, that's not what I wanted. I'm gonna have. I'm gonna get this wrong now because I haven't looked at this for a while. Um, there's a place to see where those actions were. Um, we're gone and I am not going to get it right. So I'll just kind of skip back to this. Um, this is what it looks like when you have a, uh, a simple action in GitHub pages. You can go to that little actions tab. Um, this is from MOA, MMS. Um, I made a commit. We submitted it live. And a few minutes later, you can jump in and see that it did a successful build or you can see that it failed. Um, if you're just doing Markdown, it's probably not going to fail, but sometimes you might have a, a syntactical issue that will cause it to fail or fail to deploy. Um, but you can do some things, you know, you can create your own C name so you can make it like I did. It's its own. It doesn't look like it's on GitHub, but it is. So avoiding some mistakes. Stick to the basics, right? Avoid complexity because if you commit responsibly, reverting commits are easy. That's that's a fairly simple thing to back out of a commit. However, if you push that commit to GitHub and your teammates sync it down, it is much harder to get that clawed back. It is possible, but it requires other people to be involved. So use branches judiciously. Right. Don't be afraid to branch, but use them and, and maintain them responsible. And then for me, I like to let those PRs merge those branches together or uh, you can use GitHub desktop to merge them yourself. The biggest thing I tend to tell folks, though, when we talk about this is try to avoid the golden repo state, especially if you're doing it on a solo project. You might need a golden repo for a team project. Again, that comes back to the rules and the things that you need to do. Um, in within your team, but if if you're just doing it yourself, don't be afraid to commit stuff because you might be sick the next day and not have your laptop or whatever, and you that's the only way you get to how, pick your poison, right? You know, whatever the situation is. And this is my little joke: um, if you look up how to use Git, you'll find ten people that tell you you have to rebase every other uh, week or something. I like to tell people rebasing is like freebasing. It sounded good, like a good idea, but it's probably not what you really intended to do. Uh, there's a time and a place for rebasing. Uh, rebasing, it, in essence, rewrites history. And it's not a bad, it rewrites your commit history. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to do, but I think it's generally overrated, especially if you're doing just your own little repo. That's my editorial piece on rebasing. So it's kind of like this, right? House owner says, I want to break my both my legs at the same time. <laughs> yes, approved. You can do it. And if you're comfortable and if you get to a point in your in your git journey 
and you want to do rebasing, go for it. Like nobody says you can't. It's just, I, I, I have had one rebase work for me ever. <laughs> and it was, it, you know, it just, it's, it's an easy way to go off the rails and really dig yourself a hole. And so I've just sort of reconciled that I'm going to be very judicious about choosing when to go down that rewrite history mode. So, all right. Fixing some mistakes. Um, I haven't jumped over into uh, the cons or into uh, uh, demo mode at this point. I guess I could. When you get to mistakes, because mistakes are going to happen. How many folks have made a mistake in Git that you're willing to admit? I did. Like last week, um, actually, a friend of mine uh, about a month ago reached out to me, and they had um, done some horrible things. They said their words, not mine. They had a repo that was local that hadn't been updated with the remote, uh, the GitHub version for a long time. Yet they had made a number of changes locally. And the concern was this is going to cause a nasty, nasty set of merge conflicts when I when they tried to pull this all together. And it did. And they tried to fix it. One thing that's nice about Git is when you have an error, generally speaking, especially if you're using the command line, it will try to tell you how to fix it. Now it might not give you it might be a little chat GPT where it might give you not quite the right thing, but it it'll try, right? But anyway. They had tried to fix it and it wasn't getting any better. And I said, eventually I said, well, here's the thing. How badly do you need to fix it? Do you have the good version available to you? Because maybe the easy answer is not to overthink it. Just make a copy of those good files below the repo away, burn it down and start afresh. You lose the history. They didn't care about the history, but it's a thing. Maybe not try to fix if you don't need to. They were able to with time. Uh, they went. I suggested looking at Git logs, and they found some things and were able to correct it. I don't exactly know the details, but if you can find the breakpoint, and you, or in that case, I want to say it was there was a specific divergence, and they found where that happened, and then they were able to. Um, you can revert to any previous commit by those snapshots, those hash numbers. So they were able to jump back to that point, but grab the other stuff first, and then they were they could piece it back together in a meaningful way. Uh, VS Code plugins will also help you figure that out. Tools like GitLens are are good at that, and that's where some of those uh, those pipe visual tools can help you figure out where that uh, where things went off the rails. GitHub Desktop is is good at it. I'll be a, I'll be honest, I don't really use GitHub Desktop because when I first started doing a lot of stuff in Git. Uh, GitHub Desktop was not as evolved as it has become, so it was a tool that didn't do what I needed it to do, so I'm mostly VS Code. But Git reset is the actual command, so if I had to say there was a sixth, this is probably the one you'd run into. Git reset can be given, you can give it a number of arguments, and you can go back in time, and you can do all kinds of things. And like I said, pushed, committed and pushed mistakes on team repos. That's a whole different creature because if somebody grabbed your stuff, your changes, and then made changes to it, now all of a sudden you really have to rewrite some history, and that's where it's consult the internet almost because everybody's everybody's use case is going to be a little different in how you fix. Um, oh shit, git .com is a, is a useful little tool. It has some common places or it has some common fixes to uh, common problems. And one that I really like, uh, her name is Julia Evans, uh, wizardzines.com. She writes these wonderful little uh, snapshots of content, uh, really functional stuff. And she just released a new, uh, a new zine here, a uh, couple within the last month called How Git Works. I think it's $12 is what it costs to buy it. Um, it's incredible. I haven't had a good chance to really sit down with it, but I did buy it. And um, it has, and I, I'll bring it up here, we can scroll through it in a bit. Um, it has a lot of stuff that will tell you all the commands. It will also teach you like what's going on under the hood in Git. So if you really want to understand, um, I, I really like her style of 
how she illustrates these. Um, and yeah, fixing mistakes, right? Do it early, do it often. How did you find that bug? I was there, my friend. So um, this is more GitHub related, uh, repo visibility. When you, uh, does everybody have a GitHub account at this point here? No, it's fine if you don't. Um, you can create repos and then you can share them with friends. You can share them with colleagues. You can, if you have GitHub Enterprise, that's a whole thing. You can add collaborators. Um, once you get into those realms, what I like is uh, SSH keys because passwords are dumb. So if you're starting to talk about, and you kind of alluded to this too, um, Haley, is you can set up keys and keyed access to the stuff that you need. So nobody, then it can be headless in essence. Um, but in VS Code or GitHub Desktop, usually you log in when you first install it on your desktop or on your machine. It will tokenize that, so it will remember who you are. But if you ever use it from a server command line uh, SSH style, then you'll have to create keys, but it's easy enough to do. And then signing and sign commits, and I'll poke around in a repo here after a bit, but um, there's a little verified. It's a green, a green stamp in commit history and GitHub. Um, you do that by signing your commits, which doesn't really necessarily mean anything for most people. But if you're an overachiever like I am sometimes, I will go create my own GPG key and assign it to that. And then it it does help me a little bit if I know that I'm working on, if I'm working on a, a common machine, I have those commits signed. So I might see that, why is this one commit not signed? Oh, that was the day that I was working on a different box. Not that helps me contextualize some things. And so that's all I have for slides. We can do some q and I'm happy though, to actually just jump over and show some stuff in like GitHub Desktop. So, oh, maybe before I do that, let's do the how Git works thing. So this is a little wonky to see, I've got it zoomed in a little too far, but this is, Julia's Git cheat sheet that comes along with the um, with the, the zine package. But it will tell you all these different commands, git config, username. It will tell you how to edit history at the command line, um, how to do pull changes, restore files. So there's a lot of really good nuggets in here about about that. You should totally you should totally pay the 12 bucks and buy the buy the package from her. It's cool. And then the big one is, is this. Oh, let's go back home. Here we go. Oh, not F11. There. Um, this is the table of contents. Is that Comic Sans? I was going to. I don't the same question. I don't think it is Comic Sans, but I don't know that it isn't. So. <laughs> it's close. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> if you know, you know, right? <laughs> um, but she goes into some really great details here. It's a, it's a really good, really good thing to learn more about Git if you're really, once you get comfortable with it, right? I mean, that's the whole point is learn those four things, learn those basics, how to get the stuff, play around with it. Then if you're interested, dig into this kind of stuff. You know, this will tell you a lot of things about how that works. And again, you should totally buy it. <laughs> um, Are you Julia? No, I'm okay. not. <laughs> okay. If only, <laughs> if only. Um, so GitHub Desktop, you know, this is just the application. So from here, you install it. I've already logged in, so it knows who I am. This is why it shows me some of these repos over here. I can create a repo. I can clone one from the internet. I can clone one. I can create one locally. Um, I want to find one. So let's, let's find one. I'm going to filter this. Let's do, uh, it's throwaway because I created one for throwaway. Here we go. So I want to clone this. I didn't have to do anything to clone it. It says, where do you want to clone this? Okay, let's choose this. Let's just put it on the desktop because I like to live there. So it's going to clone that for me. And there it is. So now this repo with nothing in it is there and I can do stuff with it. And from here you can commit, you know, I could add a file. Let's just do it. Um, maybe not commit copyrighted material. Uh, <laughs> Good idea. What can I, let's just make a file. 
actually make a folder test and make a file within it. New file. There we go. Good enough. If I come back over here, it's going to show me here, right? I've got one changed file. Folders generally won't, empty folders in Git generally won't show up as a change, right? It's only the files within. So if you have, I do a lot of integration stuff between vendor products on campus, and I, I ship a lot of data around. So I have a lot of stuff in, in Git that goes between uh, systems, but I'll have like a data files folder that needs to be stubbed out on the host but I don't ever want anything that winds up there to be committed. So I have a dot get ignore file that ignores that. And sometimes I put it within the data files folder. So that way I commit the, I add and commit the get ignore file within the folder so that the folder shows up when mm -hmm. I clone it down, right? Otherwise I'd have to create that folder separately. That's kind of into the weeds on that, but yeah. So here I can say, this is, Great new document. Oh, new document. It's great. Yay. And then we're going to commit that to main. And it says, yay, no local changes. But if you look up here, you'll see it says publish this branch to GitHub. So let's do it. Let's YOLO. <laughs> and if I jump over, do I have GitHub open here? No, I don't. But let's do it. GitHub. Oh, not GitHub.dev. But let's do it because there we are. Sorry, bouncing all over the place there. This is github.dev, which is quite literally VS Code in the browser. Um, but if we go to github.com, which is where I really wanted to go, I don't care about that. If I go over here and find repos, I'm used to the wider monitor when it looks different. Here we go. Here's GitHub throwaway. There's that test folder that we just created, and there's that new empty text document. There it is. So if people added to this, I can pull that back down. Um, but let's jump over to VS Code. We can do the same thing in VS Code. So I'm going to clone a repository. I'm going to say I'm going to clone from GitHub. Maybe let's try that again. It got in the way. There we are. I want the git throwaway. Where do you want to clone that to? Well, let's do repos. And let's drop it there. Would you like to open that? Sure. Let's open that. And in VS Code, I've done the same thing. And so, you know, if you're if you're not highly embedded into VS Code, you can use GitHub Desktop. If you're really embedded in VS Code like I am, you can just use VS Code. So the tooling is really nice nowadays compared to what it used to be. Um, did anybody ever use Git, uh, you know, like, five, 10 years ago and use one of those, um, was it Tortoise Git? There were some plugins that you could use at the shell level that would change File Explorer when there was a Git yeah. repo there. And then you could sort of visually see with little check marks or whatnot. Um, that was about one of the only ways you could practically um, visually see. But now with things like VS Code and these tools, it's, it's all there. So that's, I mean, that's really all I got. I can maybe answer some questions. I'm happy to nerd out about it a little bit. But, yeah. The only thing I can uh, also comment on is when editing, when contributing to other people's repos. Uh, so uh, I want to talk, uh, mention that um, what I usually recommend is uh, forking. Mm -hmm. And so uh, so, you, you, so you see somebody's report, like, hey, this is uh, really cool. I, I want to try playing around with this myself. So what you do is you, you fork, which is a uh, different operation altogether, which kind of kind of creates a, your your own copy in your own space. They can clone that, play around with it, uh, submit code back. And that's really where the pull request comes in, comes into play here. You can't push it to their repro. You can request that they pull it from yours. So that's what uh, uh, PR uh, repos are. It's interesting talking to full-time devs, and they they use PR like it's a, a you know a, a noun or you know a, a, you know or just do a, a PR and you have to translate it to what most people mean. But yeah, yeah, that's what that's what it really is. Yep. 
And that's, yeah, that's totally right. I didn't, I didn't go down that road of the forking the repo thing because usually well, I started that way too, where it was, and then I got stuck. <laughs> but, but that's also the, 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 the real power of uh, Git, GitHub is that there are so many projects out there that are really cool um, that are, are at the same time are like half done. <laughs> so if you have a chance to, hey, yeah, this was half done. Uh, but you're missing. The, let, let me just go. I'll, I'll just do it. Let me let me just fix this up here. Offer a pull request, and the author could either say, "This is really great. I'm going to incorporate it in," or, "No, I don't have the time to deal with you." And how oh, you just created your own fork of uh, the project, and now you're the one that has the more up to date version. Has anybody forked a request or forked a repo and made a pull request, and then had the author not do anything with it? Like ever, yeah, me too. <laughs> like, hey, I fixed this. Well, I, you know, I submitted something just recently, and the developer said no, and rewrote it from scratch in a much better way, and it was correct. So, okay, <laughs> <laughs> that's so, different. I, I, I won't name who this is because I, <laughs> some of you will know this person, but I fixed the thing, and I said, here, you know, we you pull that in, it's fixed, it works, and. The individual is like, I don't work in that job anymore, so I don't care. <laughs> oh, well, okay. Leave it broken then. Leave it broken. I'll just keep it for myself. <laughs> so. Well, that's a cool thing. You can go to GitHub, uh, uh, go to that repro, see that five other people have forked it, see that five other people have fixed the same problem, yep. offer pull requests, and say, oh, well, that fixed my problem. I I did come across that in the past where people have submitted a pull request to fix a particular problem. The original developer says, that's not the way I want to do it. I'm just going to ignore it for right now. But I needed that specific fix. So I incorporated the, the, the. But that's also the power of GitHub is that everything is documented. The reasons, the rejections, the discussions, everything. It is cool. Gary had his hand up. Yeah, Gary, yeah. Gary yeah. what's going on, he, Gary? Hey, Matt, so when you're using VS Code, you have to install that Git software, right? That's correct. Thank you for calling that out, Gary. Um, so it, when when you do that, yeah, if you're on a new machine, <laughs> just like what happened to Haley, you have to actually, um, my preference is to install VS Code first, but never open it, then install Git, then open VS Code. Because if you do it in that order, um, and if you want Git to interact with VS Code, it, it's the it's the simplest. But yes, you do have to install Git separately until Microsoft integrates it natively into Windows somehow, which is still my hope. But that is the exact that steps I did while you were doing this presentation. I was like, there we go. I was like, definitely missed. So, so the crazy thing is, one, uh, Git, GitHub is owned by Microsoft, but Git was originally created by, yes, you guessed it, Linus himself, so Torvald. So, um, yeah, that's always that kind of fun politics. Git, Git, <laughs> the history of Git and how it was developed is really a fascinating read. Would recommend if you're, yeah. Um, that sucks. <laughs> uh, scroll through. Red Bull on a weekend. Get it done. <laughs> Live your best life, my friends. Um, uh, man, there's some real, there's some real zingers in here. Like, had a little banter going yeah. on. Yeah. I, so my joke didn't land, and so I didn't. Rather than not defending myself in the chat, I just stopped because <laughs> Gary was brought up about what if you have commitment issues, and I wanted to be like, you have, you're good with your commit messages. As the same thing. And Gary's then I committed. couldn't make it as funny, and so I just stopped. So, yeah. anyways, sorry, Gary. I was trying to be like funnier than it was. Gary just committed. But in uh, you know, so good. Gary. <laughs> like, what is that, Gary? Oh no, it was it was it was funny. I enjoyed the the comment. I've only got eight kids currently, though. I was like, I feel like there's another, like, yeah. Um, but Gary in the comments brought up a really good point. Um, it, if you have sensitive data mm -hmm. in GitHub, it yeah, if you can avoid getting to that situation. That will save future you a whole lot of frustration because it it is possible, but it is really really difficult to claw it back. So, I'm assuming there are plugins maybe to help find that data before you you know 
GitHub will sell you one. Yeah, GitHub will sell. They'll tell you you got it's secrets deep. in your code. And there are, yeah, there are things that will look for secrets. And I, um, I had a project on, I won't call it a side project, but there was a project that I was involved with where there was an exposed dot git directory in a place it shouldn't have been and somebody found it and kindly sent an email to that team saying hey you should maybe like make that not readable on that box and we did and then we fixed in big picture there was other things that happened but we fixed that we took that action so but sensitive is tough uh, not as annoying as comic stands I got contacted by a former employer about having some of their server names in my scripts. And so I scrubbed everything, flattened the, and got rid of like all the history, but too many people had already um, owned my repo into their own GitHubs that I, I just couldn't get rid of it. So they weren't overly happy, but they accepted that I did the best that I could do. So there was another comment um, about using if you're in Git or if you're in GitHub and let me share this because. Yeah, it, it's a good point. If you're in a repo on GitHub.com and just hit dot. It will jump over to GitHub.dev in that very same thing. OK, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. That's so that cool. is that's kind of cool. Yeah, <laughs> so hitting just dot. We'll jump over there and that does exactly that. So, thank you, Jason. Um, see what else we got? Um, I think that's it. Other questions, comments? I mean, like a lot of the stuff too is if you're if you're doing more of a development flow, you're probably going to use Git in very different ways than you might as just write some scripts to do um, some systems management stuff or Ansible playbooks, or if you wanted to export task sequence XML and save that that way, you know, those things are going to give you different reasons to do different actions. Um, I mean, we're in the process of using it as we're going to go through and iterate through all of our exportable configs and everything in Azure, mm -hmm. dump them to a directory, and then have Git look for changes mm. and sync any changes. Automatically that. on a nightly basis. That. So that's one of the processes that we're not. And that's twofold. One, so that we have a version history for everything that we've done. And two, we have multiple tenants, and the small ones always get forgotten about. So now we can say, okay, well, these are supposed to be configured like that. And then on, on a time scale, okay, well, this change was committed a week ago, push it into prod in this other tenant. Yeah. I, there are some really neat. I did a one of my one of my side projects. Um, I'll call it a client project. Um, in the past, some decisions were made, and it has to do with environments, different environments. So there's a dev test environment, and there's a prod environment, but it's all part of one repo. This is not the way you would normally architect something like that, but it's it's going to be a major version change before we can really extract that and fix that. So in the meantime, what I have in place, and none of this is, this isn't about sensitive secrets or anything. This is really about some config paths and some environment specific stuff. But in the .git folder, you can do hooks. There are git hooks. And so um, it's it feels a little bit like magic and it is a little bit like magic, but I have a few, they're just bash scripts ultimately. But what happens is when I'm on the production server or on the um, the dev test server or my local instance, when I do a, a git pull, git pull will trigger uh, the merge, even if there's nothing to merge. And that merge I have a hook for that determines which branch I'm in when I made the call and then we'll set some environment variables specific to whichever branch I'm in. Um, do not recommend having to be in a situation where you need to do that, but there are some really neat, like deep within Git things that you can do to uh, automate some uh, otherwise complicated stuff. Again, you'd want to avoid it, <laughs> but if you can't, that was kind of a neat, neat way that has saved me from also, um, if we make changes in production, 
it saves me from not accidentally cloning the dev site down or being in the wrong branch on the production site. 